I'd like to take a minute to talk about one of our sponsors, Parker Sporlin and Thermostatic Expansion Valves. How can you guys always have the right thermostatic expansion valve for the right application without having to carry hundreds of valves in your truck? Well, that's simple. Using Sporlin's interchangeable cartridge style valves. The Q valve for conventional and the BQ valve for balance port. It, it, it's as easy as one, two, three. It serves thousands of unique applications. So one, you just select a thermostatic element for your application. Two, you select the body style you need. Three, you select the right size cartridge for the application. These easy to select and assemble valves mean you always have the right valve for the job on your truck. For more information on the Q and BQ valves, visit Sporland.com. Thanks guys, enjoy the episode. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Advanced Refrigeration Podcast. You're here with your host, Brett Wetzel and Kevin Compass. How's it going, Brett? Oh, just lovely. I, I, I'm in Houston, starting up our training center, getting everything prepared so we can start rolling out some in-person training. And that's really about it. How about you? Oh, I got roped back into my personal hell and uh, down here cleaning up a couple things and hoping to get rid of my personal hell store and uh, never come back. Sweet. So th- this one, I want to go over, make it a kind of short one, and we're going to go over something that uh, some guys run into from time to time and uh, could be a disaster depending on the way you play it. But no matter what, it's going to be a disaster. Uh, I want to go over restarting a flat rack and or almost flat rack so say you guys get there rack's got no pressure in it probably the worst call you could get you know you you walk up there and you look at the controller and it's zero and zero discharge and suction zero and zero it's flat so this is kind of the way i approach this first and foremost you gotta kind of try to find the leak first obviously if it's a flat rack it's a huge leak so start with the obvious places. Start looking around inside of the uh, actual room itself. Start looking for the, uh, you know, see if you see oil anywhere. And if I don't see anything inside the rack room, if I don't see like a blown apart pipe or a cracked line or something like that, I'm making a beeline just because I have terrible luck. I'm making a beeline right for the conden- condenser. See if there's a fan motor laying in there. Yeah, that's not fun. No, I mean, and then you want to try to find it, and if it, if it, say, if it is a fan motor that fell through a condenser, I instantly isolate that side of the condenser, and if it's flat, I'll start the vacuum pumps in the rack room. I'll start pulling off the liquid, the discharge, and the suction, trying to get as much air out of there as you can. We're not trying to hit microns at this point. We're just trying to get the air out and any little bit of moisture that we can get out while we're doing this. I mean, remember, we got food in here. Everything's time sensitive, so we're going to try to get this back going as fast as possible. That's why I isolate, say if it's a condenser, I isolate that that part of the condenser immediately. I'll shut that hat off, and or that half off, and uh, then, I will, uh, then I will, you know, start vacuuming out the rest of the thing, and then I will start addressing the leak. That way I can let this thing pull for a vacuum as long as I can while I'm addressing the leak, while the refrigerant's on its way, or I'm figuring out the refrigerant situation. So that that's my first priority. Finding a leak, isolating a leak, and then getting the vacuum going. Now, if you show up to a rack and it's got two or three pounds in it, you're lucky. I mean, you could just isolate where you need to be. I mean, you may not be able to find it at that point. You may have to you know, start putting a little bit of gas in there, get the pressure up a little higher to where you can actually find a leak. If it's a crack line in the store, crack line in the underground, they speared a, you know, coil with a forklift, which seems to be a uh, popular thing at uh, certain warehouses. Or you walk in there and the coil's on the ground and nobody knows what happened. So... Coincidentally, so, uh, you know, I said that I've been, you know, over at the training center, you know, getting everything set up and stuff. And 
And it just so happens, you know, one of the first racks I start working on, that's exactly the same scenario I had two and a half pounds on one side, three and a half pounds on another. And, you know, it hasn't been, you know, started up in a minute or two. And so, you know, in, I, in order to actually try to find any sort of leak, I had to get gas back in it first. You know, um, once we got the gas, you know, gas up, you know, I don't, I'm not really caring about receiver level at this point. I'm just trying to get gas back in the rack so I can leak check and, you know, try to figure out, what, you know, where, where it actually came from. How long do you think usually, Kev, does it take to pull down a, um, a rack that's been, you know, that's been down for, you know, maybe about an hour where it's been flat? A vacuum? Yeah. When it stops smoking a little bit. What? No microns at all? I mean, dude, I'm not shooting for microns when it's... Well, let's be honest here. When there's food in there, you're not shooting for microns. I mean, it depends. I mean, if it's a complete loss... And it's not like slam busy. Yeah. Maybe I'll get the micron gauge out. But if there's product in there and they're trying to save it, it's savable, then it is what it is. Get the air out, get it down to like five or 10 pounds, you know, of, of an inch of vacuum and just let it rip at that point. I mean, there's a, there's, there's a pretty good chance there's not going to be that much moisture, if any at all, at that point. But you want to at least get the air out. I mean, you're trying to save the food at this point. I mean, if it, if it is that bad, then um, it is what it is. Let it pull as long as you can. I mean, let's be honest. This this hardly ever happens during the day. It's usually at 2 o'clock in the morning for some god-awful reason. So we'll go over one, once you get the vacuum or you get everything going in there, don't purge it. I mean, it's never going to be right. Just take the extra – half hour let it pull in a vacuum let it get everything out of there so when a refrigerant gets here you hope to got it in bottles and not tanks not small tanks you hope you get bottles but let's be honest here with how cheap 90 percent of companies are you're getting small tanks so say you got to put in 800 pounds my big recommendation is you is to make a small manifold like i got a a uh, small manifold for 20 pound cylinders. I have four or five uh, quarter turn superior ball valves on there, like that they use on the target racks, the green quarter turn valves, going into a seven eighths manifold with a three eighths adapt uh, flare adapter on there. So that way I could take my three eighths hose and I could run five tanks at once. So I could put 125 pounds in at the same time. So I'll turn all the tanks on, do that, and then you're going to want to hook up to your main liquid line. So you're going to want to hook up to the 3 8 tap on the liquid uh, before or after the dryers. I mean, if it's before the dryers, it's going to be great. Also, you're going to want to change those out if you can um, before you do all this. And then you're going to want to hook the liquid on there. You're going to want to shut the receiver uh, outlet valve, and you're going to want to feed liquid straight into the liquid line, full bore, and let it go through the system and pump into the receiver. So that way you're flipping tanks. You don't got to meet or anything. You just let it go full bore through the system and suck all that gas down. You don't have to worry about it flooding or slugging because it's taking it through the evaporators. So you're taking it down the liquid line. You have the main receiver ball valve shut, the leaving ball valve. After that, there should be a 3 8 tap or a quarter tap. If you got to use a quarter, it's going to suck. If you had a 3 8 tap, it's going to go quick. So you're going to want to – this is the same way you would start charge a rack from the beginning. You're going to keep stacking. When you get like 60 to 80% receiver level in full condenser, you're ready to let it rip. You could, you could shut it off and you could uh, charge the rest from the suction. You, you could start the store back up. So this is the way I do it. I mean, you could generally, if you're going fast, you could put 800 pounds in in less than half an hour. Hey guys, I want to take a break and talk about Westermeyer, one of our other sponsors. Today's episode is sponsored by Westermeyer Industries, the leader in oil management and pressure vessels for the commercial refrigeration industry. What's what's the vacuum setup that you use to actually get that down? Uh, you know when you're doing it. So I have uh, blue vac hoses, so and a fuel piece vacuum pump, and then another. 10 CFM pump 
But I, I have blue back hoses, so I have a vacuum tree in my truck that um, one of my guys made out of stainless. And I could basically hook five, seven, eight. They're basically set what would be seven eighths diameter copper, the three quarter inch hoses. And I could change the ends from quarter inch, five eighths, or quarter inch, half inch, and three eighths. So I could adapt these hoses to anything I need. So, like, I could move a ton of air real quick. So, I mean, my pull down times are relatively quick. So, more than you're going to get with using your gauges. I mean, you don't want to do that. You want to use straight hoses, biggest hoses you can, no core depressors. I mean, you want to try to get on the big packs on the rack. See, I don't, ha- I, you know, I don't have the blue bag set up. I basically have, well, you know, what you have made for your, uh, for your, you know, filling. You know, basically, it's a you know, piece of inch and inch and three eighth uh, copper with a bunch of packed angle valves on there, and that's basically how I, you know, either pull, you know, pull it back and, like you said, actually charge it up. Yeah, I mean that that's fine for what you know what you're doing. I mean it works fine. I just went with a completely different setup. I mean we had so much stainless laying around from doing all these CO two jobs that uh, I ended up buying a couple uh, cheap uh, KF fittings for these vacuum hoses and uh, having them take them on when we were doing all the stainless uh, condenser piping. So same thing. I have a nice charging header. Like I have a, a eight port three eighths by hat it's a half inch outlet uh stainless charging header that i use for co2 and for uh dx refrigerants so i could do 800 pound cylinders at the same time Damn. going going from a half inch hose like i don't i don't use a half inch hose or i don't use a three eighths hose when, I, when i'm doing that i use a half inch hose i'll even if it has a three eighths adapter on there i'll throw um uh three eighths to half inch flare reducer and generally, if it's flat, flat, I may burn in on the on the liquid line. I may burn in a half inch packed angle valve. I carry like five or six in my truck. For startups, I burn them in because I'd rather pull on a half inch in charge on a half inch packed angle valve because it goes way quicker. And I tell you right now, you're probably going to want to ground those tanks. <laughs> I was just about to say that. So as, I, as those two scales I shorted out on uh, yesterday, <laughs> I was talking to Kevin. And he's like, "Hey, um, you know, did you know the static electricity could actually take out a scale?" I'm like, "No, I've never heard of that." Yeah, yeah, two two are dead, two are dead. Yeah, they were they were brand new. But static electricity will, it, especially like the JV ones, it'll like short them out. Like one of them didn't even make it five minutes, and it was done. Like it, it was so bad. I was I was recovering in an Aldi, and I was moving so much refrigerant out of this thing with push pull in it that, I mean, you couldn't even touch the tanks or you were getting electrocuted. Like I mean, it was jumping like a good three inches, like the arc was. So like I mean, everybody was you know getting pissed and because everybody would walk by and like was getting shocked by these tanks because all static electricity. Because I mean, I had the rack from. I mean, they hold like 350 pounds. It was empty in 35 minutes. That's insane. It, it was down to two pounds in 35 minutes. Just using the rack and four recovery drums and uh, the the Appian recovery machine. Jesus. I mean, and I, I have a little water-cooled uh, heat exchanger I use, but I mean, that, that thing was just, it was just slamming gas. So yeah, you you will you will short out, and the same thing with charging. It does the same thing. Even if you ch- touch like a black charging hose, it'll shock the shit out of you. So, so what ground it ground it from the tank down, uh, just an earth ground or what? So I actually have copper in my truck or wire in my truck that I stripped out. Like it's probably like twenty feet long. I stripped out like sections that are like six inches long every couple like two feet, and I'll wrap it around the tanks around the tank heads and just like i'll make a daisy chain that way i can ground it so guys when you guys have a major loss of refrigerant sorry um you know make sure that you know you are being safe um now i used to work with ammonia refrigerant years ago but like you know 
they, they both displace the oxygen out of your lungs. I was actually at a warehouse store and the rack, it, it was messed up, man. Cause like we, we walked there for something running a little bit warm. So we did all the preliminary checks on the inside of the rack house. Right. And then we're like, all right, well maybe there's something inside. So we walk in, we're walking the box and close the door behind us. And I hear something. And as I start getting closer, like I'm li- I, like, I feel like I'm at the dentist's office. Like everything's going wah, wah, wah. And I'm, I, I'm starting to feel lightheaded. I'm like, get out, get out. I was with a younger kid and I was like, let's just get the hell out. And I, it was the first time I think I've ever really been gassed out with, with a DX refrigerant where, you know, I actually felt extremely lightheaded. You know what I mean? And I was only in there for about three minutes. So then by the time that we actually walked back out to the rack house, because we then realized that we had a major leak and we had to try to isolate it from the rack, rack was flat. It didn't take but probably 30 minutes from the time getting up, using a lift to get up there and getting back out to the rack house and realizing, oh, shit, this rack is now flat. Yeah, one time we were doing a gas changeover and we were prepping everything. We're getting ready to do the first changeover the next night. And it was not the rack we were getting ready to do. It was the rack we were doing like two days prior or two days after that. Guy was in there. He's an apprentice, like third year. And he was changing the reliefs. And all I remember is hearing somebody yell, make sure you put a backup on that. And he snapped the relief tree off the receiver. Oh no! And this thing went up past my head, hit the ceiling of the rack room, down, dented to the floor, back up again, hit the ceiling, and then into the stuck in the wall. And instantly, this entire room just went white. And this was uh, a very small rack room. It was a rack in a box. It was a uh, like a Connex style box yeah. and five guys in there. There's two doors. There's five guys in there. There's shit all over the floors from working. And next thing you know, it is just white. Holy and shit. Yeah. I mean, thank God uh, the two of us were on both ends and we were able to valve off the receiver ball valves and then kill all the switches and get, get it like, aired out and then uh we got the emergency fan on but yeah i mean just just big thing always 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 i say this to all other apprentices look at the your way in and way out your backup way in and way out and look at the ball valves in the rack no in a, in an emergency what you got to die for you know to keep you know, yourself safe. I mean, screw the refrigerant. I mean, it is what it is, but you also don't want to fog out a store and put everybody else at risk. But, I mean, just know your surroundings, know your ball valves, don't panic, and, you know, know what to look for. You want to look for main ball valves. Like, like I always tell these guys, if you've got a racket blue line in a store or you break something, bite off the big cheese. Go for the, the you know the big hits. Kill the compressors, kill the circuits, and then go for the main ball valves. Discharge liquid, and go for those. I mean, that that should be your focus, and get out of there. Even if you have to, use, sorry. Go ahead. Even if you have to use the emergency buddy button, because basically the emergency button will shut off all the equipment. It's usually a shunt circuit, and it will also usually turn on the exhaust fan. So they wouldn't let me break the glass. I've always wanted to, I've always wanted to break the glass. There's always spares there. Uh, there, there, there's never, I never see any spares. I've always wanted to break the glass. <laughs> I <I'd> unscrew it. <laughs> <laughs> my, my buddy wouldn't let me. He's like, as soon as I went to go pick it up, he's like, don't do it. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so like, just, just go for the, Go for the you know the big stuff and try to get that off first. But once you get that like back back to start this thing back up, so we trailed off here. So once you get that receiver up to like sixty or eighty percent by charging in the liquid line, once you get it up to like sixty or eighty percent and you let it pump down and everything shut off, then you're ready to go. So you're gonna shut your tanks off, 
uh, you're going to open up your main liquid slowly and you're going to let it start flowing again. And then everything should start coming back. Your oil, everything should start staging back. That is the easiest way to charge a rack that is flat or needs a ton of gas is through the liquid line. You want to put it in through that three-eighths tap. I mean, you're ho hopefully the manufacturer put it before the dryer so you can at least filter that refrigerant that's coming in there. But half the time, it's after the dryer. I don't know why they do that. I mean, some manufacturers are better about it than others, but it seems like Husband always puts it after the dryer. I, I don't know. I mean, but th that that is how you quickly charge a rack is in through the liquid line. Now, let's say you drop the fan through the condenser. I mean, you could still start this rack back up generally with one side of the condenser down. I mean, it's the middle of summer. You're going to be struggling. I mean, you may be able to shut some circuits down and, you know, keep the core stuff like the walk-ins or uh, something like that cool and then make them pull the cases while they're doing that. And then you could repair that side of the condenser and, you know, take some stress off you. Yeah, I mean, there's cases still down, but the food and the walk-ins is good or like half the store is running. And then you could focus on getting that side of the condenser repaired, whether you're going to sleeve the copper or you're going to pinch tubes. I try not to pinch tubes. Pinching tubes is like the latchest effort because generally these people are not going to change that condenser until it's a disaster. And or it's the middle of summer, especially with how everything is now, you're probably not getting a condenser for six months. So I've had really good luck with sleeving tubes. If they're half inch, I sleeve them with five eighths. If they're, you know, three eighths, I sleeve them with half. I slide them through, and then I'll pinch up on them a little bit, and then I'll brace them shut. Any, uh, you use 56, 15? What are you using? 15. Okay. And a rosebud. I mean, I'll burn out around it where I need with a rosebud, and uh, you know, core my way through it, depending on how thick it is. I mean, if it's an evaporator, could evaporative condenser like leak you're pretty much screwed your pension tubes. I mean, yeah. I, I've been able to fix like one or two. It, it's, it's, you're not going to be able to get into where it needs to be. So, I mean, let's talk about if it's a coil, if it's a coil, just valve it off and do your thing. I mean, Brett, you've seen it where those distributors break off when they get a little bit of ice in the blades and distributors break off. If, I know it's in, say, it's in box A. You know, I know the leaks in box A. Box A has four coils in there. You know what? I'm not even going to waste my time. I'm valving off all four coils. And then I'll go on, start getting the rack back up going. I'll come back. Whatever one's flat, that's the circuit that has the leak. That is the easiest way to find a one with there, unless you could hear it. If you can't hear it, I mean... I'll valve off every coil in that box, and then I will wait to see which one goes flat. Because it's if it's that big, it's going to go flat. So I'll let it go flat. I'll get the rest of the rack back up and going, and then I can start turning circuits on in there while I let that box air out. I mean, a big box like a Sam's Club or a Costco could take an hour, two hours to air out. I mean, don't be afraid to put a fan in there, blowing air in there. I mean, don't. I mean, screw the product. I mean, it's not worth you getting hurt over. See, it seems like I never, I never get the condenser, th uh, you know, falling through the coil. I think I've only had one of those my whole entire career. It's usually, you know, we've lost the whole charge during a hot gas or you know, hot gas or cool gas defrost when it busted a line. So within it going, you know, within the time of it going into defrost, and maybe like twenty minutes later, we've you know essentially lost every bit of freaking gas in that rack. And the only other ones that I usually get are the, yeah, it's usually that or, or rub through, uh, uh, rub, rub through uh, Kush clamp, you know, but because I'm, I'm so big on those, you know, checking those out during the PM, you know, th those have actually slowed down a lot. The rub through Kush clamp is like my biggest pet peeve. So my last shop, it was the cracked, protocol discharge lines all the time because we serviced a lot of all these so it was the uh the typical you know protocol shook shook itself to death like a, a you know uh ford model t going down the road and then oh. crack discharge lines 
Well, about that, you know, just make sure that, you know, a lot of those scrolls, because they don't seem like they have a lot of flex, but they really do. Um, we had a rack that, that kept cracking, you know, because you got three pipes on that compressor if it's a low temp, right? You got the vapor injection, you got the discharge, and you got the suction, right? And basically, this thing would keep cracking every every so just every so often. So you know, they had me go out there just to check it out. And the older compressors that were still you know from the manufacturer had steel feet. Uh, the ones that they replaced, they replaced with the rubber and got rid of the steel. So basically, having that rubber there basically caught you know caused it to shift just enough to to crack the line. And I, since God, I will say this: when they rubber mount those those compressors especially the way Husband does it in the protocols with the, like they use a factory bolt through it, that, that factory Copeland bolt. Dude, those things, I don't care how solid it is. It's going to crack at some point in its career. You look at a target rack in a box store. How often have you seen a target crack a discharge line? An actual physical crack. I don't think I've ever seen one when, do it. And they, when they had it, when they had it mounted on the rubber, if they mounted on yeah. the steel, there's no, there's no, there's no shift. There's no shift, and that's the problem with the with those with those compressors with those protocols why they crack like that because What's, they got that shift and they try putting that belly band on there and then it does, still doesn't help. Put steel feet on it, like put, like put put spacers underneath, washers, whatever you have to do. The, the problem is, is if you look at the targets. They're they're welded studs. They're welded studded feet. The cop the Copelands and the protocols are bolted through the top of the compressor with that sleeve bolt. So it get it gets more flex and more play, whereas you have welded studded feet like you would a normal compressor. Okay. That that's my thoughts on it. But you know, that that's usually what I end up running into. Or the other thing, sorry. Go ahead. The other thing about uh, cracks and lines, if this were to happen, because you know we're we're talking about having the rack down, but also the correct way to fix it. So if you do have a crack, uh, what is recommended is basically uh, uh, stopping it at each end. Like so, wherever the the crack extends to, uh, use a small small drill bit just at the end of the cracks uh, to basically terminate the cracks. So, you know, basically instead of a sharp you know, crack that it's going to do. If you actually, um, you know, drill a small hole, it basically the energy is then dispersed throughout that that half moon that's there, right? So it's not as much um, flex on the pipe. So before you actually, you know, if you can't and you don't have the material to get that thing back up and running, like, you know, whether it be a, you know, a coupling or a T or whatever the hell that you need, um, if you terminate the crack and then fill it in, um, basically it won't continue to to crack. And that's the other thing. So, like, when you fix that, when you turn it, when you go over it with silk floss, that part of that joint is stronger than the copper. So, wherever the silk floss is, is actually has more physical tensile strength than the copper. So, it'll just crack on the other side of the silk floss. So, like, a lot of times, if I know I have a crack and I'll drill the holes, like Brett said, I'll but I'll get it in, get nice hot buttered in, and I'll go all the way around with silk floss. Even though I'm not filling a joint, I'll go all the way around the joint on the outside of the pipe with the silk floss. So that way I am, you know, terminating the crack, but I'm also keeping it from starting again where the silk floss stops. Now, if it's a scroll compressor and it's doing this, it's getting condemned. Because Besides what you said, 90% of the time when those things start cracking discharge lines, there's something wrong with the compressor. Or overcycling, right? I mean, how many times have you had a crack? You know, because, you know, you're, are you really paying attention when refrigerants freaking refrigerant oil are spraying everywhere? And you're like, oh, let me look at the compressor cycling. No, you're not. That's something that you're going to find out the next day. You know what I mean? When you go back to basically make sure that, you know, everything's still rolling right. Yeah, I mean, same thing with, like, rub-throughs. If you can't change a pipe, you know, make sure you butter it up good. I mean, you know, get it in there, get it, you know, sucked in the joint a little bit, and then, you know, backfill a little bit and butter it out, you know. And then make sure you get all the cush clamps on there. 
that has got to be by far the most preventable annoying leak there is is from that and i've had it dump racks on me a couple times you know so i mean that's one thing you want to look for if it's underground i'm valving it off and leaving and it's, i mean there ain't nothing you can do about it in the middle of the night i mean you're not doing an emergency overhead <laughs> God. So <laughs> when I first started, we had this crazy old guy we work with. He convinced me that uh, we were going to rerun these lines overhead without getting approval from anybody. So I, I didn't know I was an apprentice and we were in the like southern border of Michigan. This guy orders 1,500 feet of pipe and insulation. And reruns this line. Me and th two other guys rerun this entire line for this case. And yeah, it, it, it was a nightmare. And then we ended up having to redo it because uh, he sized all the lines wrong. <sighs> but yeah, so if it's underground, I'm leaving it. That's a Monday problem. Um, also, one of the biggest no nos in the world is. Um, do not, please do not, unless you want to get fired, do not use nitrogen on a system just because you have ball valves isolating it from the system. Please don't. Yeah, are, go ahead. Like barely hold for vacuums or, you know, repairs. I mean, they're not going to hold nitrogen back. Yeah, exactly. We would, you know, there was a guy that I know of that, you know, Basically messed up, put uh, nitrogen, you know, on on the side because he couldn't find a leak because he kept, you know, he kept uh, losing pressure. Well, he kept losing pressure because ball valves were leaking. That's why he wasn't being able to pull a vacuum. And it turned out that the ball valves were leaking. So when he put the 300 pounds of nitrogen in the system, the compressors didn't like that, and it broke, and it broke bad. Yeah, I mean, generally sweep them over a refrigerant, you're going to find a leak faster. I mean, with a leak detector than you are with nitrogen. I don't, I don't even have a tank of nitrogen in my truck. So, I mean, that's, uh, you're going to put refrigerant in there and use that. I mean, you're just, you're not going to dump it out. Generally, it's going to be used as trace gas, you know, to find it. So, I mean, I don't know. I, I've never had to bump up. A rack. I know we've had bump to bump up circuits with nitrogen. We've done that before, but we're cutting them loose and doing it. I was going to say the only time that you're going to do that is if you're going to actually cut and cap it. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, in in ten years, we've done that twice. We had to so up in up up in New England. There's a lot of cases that run underground. Like they'll they'll have a bunch of them that are running underground. And we tried all the normal tricks where, you know, basically you just, you know, close off the suction line see if the PPM increases, to, um, you know, isolate the whole, you know, one whole system and see when the PPMs go down. No, we, we just, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't acting like that at all. And, and part of the reason why I think we, we've ended up finding out that there was ice over this, over the whole entire pipe and basically causing, you know, causing it not to, you know, be as bad as what it was, but because it's in a confined space, it was still, you know, measuring pretty high PPM, you know? So when the thing would go into a defrost, you might almost get down to, you know, get down to the system, you know, so it would let more gas out and then it would just freeze right back over. Yeah. We had that in a store where it actually, it actually crushed the liquid lines. And the ice got so bad in the pit, it crushed two liquid lines. Mm hmm. So we ended up, you know, finding the one and then it instantly would go flat. So we thought that was that one. Then we found another one. And then I looked over at the glass doors and realized that they were fucking, they were leaning. The ice had gotten so bad, it was picking up the glass doors. Oh, no. So at that point, we scrapped it. We ran, we ran, we ran the whole rack overhead. Because, I mean, all the, it was all compromised. So I had a question about what you said before. You said that you charge it up anywhere from 60 to 80%. Um, you never overcharge it by doing that all the way up there? No. Okay. It's generally, generally 60%-ish in the wintertime. In the summertime, I'll go 80 in the wintertime. 
Just for the – well, I mean, so you're an extreme freaking cold up there, though. Yeah. I mean, but then I'll, I'll start it up. I mean, that I'll go – I will go 80, 80% when it's in split condenser, 60% if it's in running full condenser. Okay. So that, that way I could uh, – that way I could uh, um, have enough gas and don't have to worry about it. I mean, obviously, you, you live in an arid desert hell. I don't live in Vegas. Vegas. It was only 100. It was, it was only 100 here today. It was 100 for a week in Chicago and everything was on fire. Is it actually cool down there now? Yeah. I wouldn't know. I'm not there. <laughs> Stuck in shit, Lewis. Wonderful. Yep. Well, guys, I think that's a real good brief overview of uh, how to restart a rack, especially one that was down its flat. So um, next next one, we're going to be uh, dialing into the, uh, the comm issues and all that stuff. So we're going to break it down to sections, CPC, Dan Foss, some microthermal. We're going to have some RDM in there. Hopefully, I think Brett lined up somebody from RDM to be on. Yep. So we'll get some RDM in there and uh, go from there. We'll dive a little more and more deeper into it. It's probably going to be like a five or six part episode. So, all right, guys. Uh, thanks for listening. Have a nice one. Later, guys. <laughs>